And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our interview with Emery, I want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've con contributed $10 or more to the specific episode. They're going to get access to our Slack channel. We've also got our Tomorrow producers. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to the uh, uh, this specific episode, and they're going to get access to free worldwide shipping from our swag store. So thank you to everyone who've contributed. If you'd like to help crowdfund this is a shows of tomorrow head on over to patreon.com slash tmro easy for me to say all right uh, this week we bring on a longtime viewer and uh, multiple guest emery stagmer he's going to be talking about small sets which i think is uh, appropriate based on the number of launchers that we've been talking about and all the different uh, uh, innovations that are happening in the small sat market and this is actually emery an area that you you work in like daily is it not Right. Yeah. Um, I'm a flight software engineer for satellite systems. And for the last three to five years, we've been talking to uh, internal and external customers within uh, Northrop Grumman about making really, really small satellites using the CubeSat form factor. Uh, I first became aware of the CubeSats uh, about 10 years ago. There's a CubeSat um, conference that's held every year at uh, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And uh, I went like 10 years ago and saw that the universities were doing some really interesting stuff with these super small satellites. Um, and then at the SmallSat conference in Utah three years ago, we started to hear about people who were looking, starting to look at this form factor for more operational units uh, where you could start to talk about, you know, high reliability, the kinds of reliability and longevity on a system that, you know, you would normally expect out of something the size of, you know, maybe a refrigerator. Um, but here, I've actually got a prop. You know, not like props, right? This is the size of a satellite that we're talking about. Actually, this is a little bit bigger. Wow. The CubeSat standard, right. The CubeSat standard is 10 centimeters. This is 11. Okay. And it's 10 centimeters tall. This is 13. Because I just measured it with my, you know, handy dandy caliper. Um, and... And so this is not like the power box or the the um, you know the avionics or the the propellant tank. This is the whole satellite, a one unit CubeSat. Now they make them in multiples, okay? So they make you know three tall, and that's a three U CubeSat. And if they make them you know three tall and two wide, that's a six U CubeSat, right? So we're talking about something you know this big and that wide. Right. So you're talking about, uh, you know, two cereal boxes for an entire mission. What can now, you do with something like that, though? I mean, you traditionally think of these giant satellites with huge solar arrays and huge powerful antennas. Trying to shrink that into something that is smaller than a Kleenex box uh, it seems like you have to give something up. So what utility do these CubeSats have? That's been the real interesting point is that the electronics, the optics um, and the kinds of science instruments that you want to be able to fly are getting smaller and smaller. And it's kind of like the reverse of the, of what we call the tyranny of the rocket equation, where every time something gets bigger on a rocket, everything else gets bigger. And then that thing gets bigger and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. Well, the reverse of that is also true. As soon as something gets smaller, everything gets smaller. And then, it, and then that gets smaller and smaller. Right. So it's kind of like the reverse. The smaller it gets, the smaller it gets. And so when you can start saying, oh, I can take out the mass of the optics or I can take out some of the mass for the electronics. Oh, well, then I don't need as much power or I don't need as big a reaction wheels or I don't need as much propellant. And so the satellites then get smaller and you start to get from, you know, a cubic meter satellite to a cubic foot satellite. Sorry, I'm mixing units. I know that's going to drive Jared crazy. <laughs> uh, but... But you get down, people understand, you know, something this big, then you get start to get down to something this big. And then you start talking about, well, who's making systems? Who's making electronics for these things? Um, and what we've found over the last three to five years is that there are multiple producers who are making electronics for these. And unfortunately, the, the, um, the reliability and and the success of those missions has been significantly lacking. Uh, they have a better than 50% failure rate. Hmm. 
And sometimes the missions are put it in orbit and, and prove that you got it in orbit and talked to it. Okay, and that mission fails, which means you never heard from it at all. You know, they deployed it into orbit. You never got it back. You never heard anything. So you don't know what happened. Um, things like um, LightSail 2, for instance, had a software problem. And so you've got these kinds of uh, both hardware and software failures that really limit the reliability of these kinds of missions. And generally, you know, they work for six months or a year, but they eventually, you know, you're flying low cost, low quality components. And so, you know, you just can't have reliability for satellite the last three, five, eight years with a, with a predictable, you know, lifetime. So that's where Northrop Grumman started to take a look in the last couple of years at, well, what would it really take to, uh, take the kinds of reliability that we've built into systems uh, for the last 20 or 30 years where we've never had an on-orbit failure. You know, um, I've worked on, I've lost count, 12 or 15 missions in the last 20 years. We've never had an on-orbit failure. We've never had a piece of hardware fail. We've never had a piece of software fail. Um, and so if you can bring that kind of reliability to the CubeSat environment, now you're starting to talk about being able to have a satellite that has a three to five year reliability that only costs single digit millions where they used to cost a hundred million plus. So Northrop Grumman right now is working on taking, uh, you know, in my notes it says 24 years, 30 missions of heritage of successful satellite missions, but they're generally these larger satellites uh, that you know fill up you know, a good chunk of this studio space, but taking that technology and compressing it down into something that's more of a CubeSat size, so you can actually reduce the size and cost of everything, and potentially deploy a lot of these all at once instead of just one per mission. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the kinds of deployers that people are are building, uh, people like uh, Planetary Systems and some others, uh, where they can bolt these things onto almost everything that's flying. Uh, including the space station, the Atlas V rockets, the Falcon 9 rockets, the Soyuz rockets, I mean, just everything. Um, and so we're seeing, we're starting to see numbers on the order of a couple of hundred satellites a year that are getting put up into low Earth orbit in these CubeSat form factors. So a couple questions from the chat room, if we could, uh, which is you, you talked about a greater than 50% failure rate on a lot of these CubeSats. Um, what is the collision, this is from Destructor 1701, what is the collision risk on these little things? Um, do they have, is there like a keep out zone for these or is it just kind of you launch it and just hope for the best? Well, they launch them um, on a sequence and so uh, the deployers will uh, pop them off at a, at a predetermined time in the launch profile. So um, they're, they're not getting, they're not interacting with each other. They're generally ejected at uh, some numbers of meters per second, uh, single digit meters per second away from the rocket. So they're not, they're not interacting with each other. They're just either things aren't deploying or the electronics fail to operate. Um, generally those are always launched off. And so there's a deployer um, pin puller inside the the uh, the ejector um, that that you know shoots these things out essentially, but it pulls a pin as it goes, right? And so when you pull that pin, closes a switch, and the thing turns on. But if it doesn't turn on, you know, mission over, you know. But then we still have a space debris problem with uh, something like that. Are these at a low enough speed and altitude where they just kind of come back after a month or two, or not even that, and just burn up in the atmosphere? Sure. The uh, the total. Um, orbital inertia mass and is is very in, involved in the, um, the the amount of energy that the satellite has, and so the smaller the satellite is, the more that atmosphere and things like that will affect it. And so it'll it'll come back in, you know, into the re-enter the atmosphere um, much earlier than a larger satellite, even in the same orbit. Now at Northrop Grumman, you're working on more than just the software control side of it, right? It's kind of a whole package for control. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. We're building an entire avionic system that we can use as the central, uh, you know, piece of computer hardware and power systems in these super small satellites. Um, being able to bring, um, you know, the larger engineering organization and with a deep understanding of space physics and physics reliability uh, means that we're able to do some things that are 
pretty fancy. Um, the the biggest, most expensive processor that you can fly in space right now is made by BAE Systems, and it's that processor card. It's a whole card. It's got memory and everything on it. But that processor card is multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars and runs at 100 megahertz and has a single core processor. <laughs> I know that's just mind-boggling to somebody. I mean, your, your phone, at, your phone has more power yeah. than that. My phone has thirty times as much power <laughs> than that, and I don't even know how much more memory it has. But that's the processor you're using to do. You worked on things like Elcross. Is that a similar processor to yeah. what you used for going that to the moon? That was the processor. Yeah, that was the processor we used on Elcross. That's the processor that we built the avionics not only for Elcross but also for LRO. Elcross was essentially a copy of LRO's avionics and power system. Right. We basically just duplicated it and, and uh, bolted it on uh, what's called an ESPA ring. I don't remember what that stands for. I'm sorry. It's an acronym. Um, but it's basically the politely known as a sewer pipe uh, that, that hooks onto the top. And then we bolted boxes around the outside. Um, it's the same diameter. It's essentially the interface adapter ring that goes in between the upper stage and the primary payload. So it was the adapter ring that sat in between the Centaur upper stage and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And what we did is we bolted electronics and thrusters on the outside of that ring and made a satellite out of it. But it's the same electronics as, as LCROSS. So LCROSS and LRO both flying this RAD 750 processor. So what we're doing in the CubeSat environment is we're taking a, a new processor uh, by a different company and we're making our own processor card. We make Printed wiring boards, you know, does not only design them, but we have a manufacturing facility at our location. We made, to say that we made the avionics, we made the processing cards uh, and the power system cards that went in those boxes. So we're applying that same level of understanding, reliability, engineering to a processor card that's this big and that thick, right? And so you have a processor card, then you have a mezzanine memory card, and then you have a solar array module interface card and a power switching card and you can stack them up in kind of multiple you need more you need more memory you need more power you need more solar arrays you can add more slices but just that simple stack is three quarters of a unit of a cubesat so it's 77.5 centimeters by 10 by 10 centimeters so one of the reasons you have very large satellites is uh, when you're out in space, you don't have a magnetosphere to help protect against radiation. So you have right. to protect, uh, I mean, big, heavy boxes to protect against radiation because uh, radiation whipping through a processor can, can really screw it up. Uh, do you have any sort of, uh, this is, comes from uh, Anonym, I believe is how you pronounce that. Uh, in small sets, do you ha use any sort of radiation protection uh, for hardened controllers or processors, or do you use redundancy, or do you have something to protect against uh, space-based radiation? A little bit of all of that. You have two different kinds of radiation that you have to worry about. You have single event upsets, which is an ionizing piece of radiation that can flip a bit in a satellite, and then you have something called um, TID, total ionizing dose, and that's how long a piece of electronics essentially can survive in a given radiation environment. Um, it can soak up so much radiation, and generally that's in um, kilorads, thousands of rads. So um, we we start talking about having a reliable thing that'll that'll live in space, and we start talking about 100 to 300 k rad. Um, the processor, uh, some of the processors that we've used in the past are mega rad, but the new, um, the new memory systems that we are now putting on these CubeSats are mega rad. So you're talking about a million rads of total ionizing dose before those things uh, will have a problem. So they can survive a very long time and their tolerance to um, single event upsets is very, very high. Uh, this one comes from Blue Gl Glacius. Uh, so you talked about uh, the Light Sail project, which is a planetary society um, solar sail, essentially uh, and using. And oh yeah, yeah, there you so go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so they flew I that. Side <laughs> uh, mentioned there was a software fault, but they, they it was essentially successful missions, uh, plural. Uh, other than sails, are there any propulsion systems that can send CubeSats from low Earth orbit to lunar orbit? Because uh, you, you, there's a lot of uh, change in velocity oh, required for that. Oh, there's a bunch. Um, and in fact, they're, they're looking at um, both uh, ion drives, um, and uh, I've seen one that actually 
uses uh, instead of xenon uh, uses iodine. Uh, that one is stupendous. Uh, the iodine drive is really cool. Um, I've seen some systems that have uh, many hundreds of meters of change in velocity, uh, meters per second and change in velocity. So yeah, you could actually fly these small CubeSats um, out to out to lunar, um, out to geosynchronous. That's a big idea right now. Like the Chinese satellite that you just showed along with, you guys showed in the new segment along with the uh, Tiangong 2, the little, the little satellite. I mean, it's, um, that's a probably, they didn't really say how big it was, but it's in the cubic foot range, you know, multiple, maybe bigger, slightly bigger than a cubic foot. Um, and um, yeah, being able to, to then do that kind of observation, it's one of the things that a lot of the agencies are looking to do is, is have these super small satellites. Uh, they're less expensive. They're a little bit more expendable. Um, they're harder to detect. Uh, <laughs> so for now, uh, that, for now, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it, you know, if you're actively broadcasting, you're fairly easy to detect because you know you're emitting RF radiation because that's how you have to talk to the ground. Um, but yeah, so there, the people would like to be able to go inspect other satellites, um, and uh, yeah, there's there's. Any, any agency and any commercial entity that's looking to do anything in space uh, with Earth observation, uh, science observations, communications, satellite to satellite kinds of th things, everybody's looking at CubeSats. So I got two questions that kind of relate to each other. One is from uh, Paco De Niro, uh, which is, why aren't people trying to send a CubeSat to the moon? Although I, I think maybe they are. And the second one is from Cogen7, which is, are there any plans for Lagrange point CubeSats? So, uh, all right, so maybe people are planning on sending CubeSats to the moon, but why haven't they gone there yet? Um, I think it's just a matter of you had to have a satellite that had sufficient reliability uh, because to get to the moon, especially with a CubeSat, unless you're hitchhiking on something that's already going to the moon, uh, you've got to have a lot of delta V. You've got to be able to have a large change in velocity in order to get from Earth orbit to lunar orbit, even to lunar flyby. Um, and... So it takes a long time. It takes months if you're going to use uh, an ion drive to get that far. And so you've got to have a reliability that's going to, you know, not only take you months to get there, but then be able to survive months once you're up there. And the moon's a much more harsh radiation environment. You said you're outside the magnetosphere. Uh, you have a lot more um, direct cosmic rays. You're in the solar wind. The solar wind hits things like the solar wind hits the moon at a million miles an hour and has all kinds of ionized particles on it, including protons. Uh, so the moon's radiation environment's pretty harsh. Uh, are there any um, um, plans to take what Northrop Grumman is doing and just uh, allow anyone to buy it? Is that kind of how that works right now? So tomorrow wants to build a CubeSat and I want to use what you guys are working on. Am I able to do that or is this for more government agencies, uh, larger customers kind of thing? No, it's pretty much any customer. Uh, but what, it, it's still a fairly expensive proposition, right? This is a, we're not bringing the price of CubeSats down to $5,000. We're still in the $100,000 million range here. If you want to buy a CubeSat from an organization like um, ISI Space or uh, Pumpkin, uh, they have uh, CubeSat Kit is, is the pumpkin place to go buy CubeSat systems and um, CubeSat Shop is the place to go. So I think that's that's ISI space. Um, you're talking about being able to buy all the pieces that you need to fly a satellite for, I think the number's about $65,000 for a turnkey piece of hardware. Okay. That's a but, lot lower than I thought you were going to say, actually. But... The reliability, it doesn't come with flight software. you got to provide that yourself. It doesn't mm. provide an instrument. It does provide power, and, and I think that that, is, that price might even include uh, might even include solar rays. Um, trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, less than $100,000. However, if you really want to be able to talk about, oh, I want a satellite that's going to last me three to five years or eight years, you know, oh, I want to go to the moon or I want to go to Mars, now you're talking about single-digit millions of dollars. 
But that's still far less. So if you're going to the moon or Mars, that's, that's a slightly different mission profile, right? That's still far less than what we, what we would ever spend on anything else that we've ever used to go to the oh, moon yeah. or Mars by, oh, yeah, yeah. by a large percentage. Oh, yeah. El Cross was probably one of the cheapest missions that ever went to the moon. And that mission was $100 million. So you can do this for 100 times less, potentially, 100 times less using CubeSats that have the capability of staying out there uh, for quite a while. Would you be able to do the same things that Elcross was able to do, or would you have to li limit the scope of that mission uh, just due to the size of the vehicle? I don't know about the uh, I don't know about the optics that we actually used for the. Of course, with Elcross we had pretty good sized thrusters, right? Because we were trying to control the Centaur, so uh, we were moving the Centaur upper stage around, and it weighs two tons. So you got to have a lot of propellant when you're going to do that, and that starts to drive your mass. Um, if I just wanted to go and take pictures, um, actually, you can get a pretty decent camera with uh, electronics and optics that'll survive, and you can put that in a 6U CubeSat, and you could do a pretty slick mission to the moon. Man, I'm seeing a Kickstarter campaign here. Wouldn't that be cool? A, cr a crowdfunded <laughs> yeah, yeah. mission to the moon, grab some pictures of like an Earthrise type thing. Uh, that seems like it'd be all sorts of awesome, and you could do it yeah. for probably a million or less, not including the launcher. Right, so yeah. the, the launcher is kind of the hard part, but we have, you know, we've got all these small CubeSat launchers coming online. We've got the Electron rocket. Um, uh, we've got Launcher One from Virgin Galactic. There are a bunch of. I, I, there's a number. Actually, I think you sent me the number. It's something like thirty uh, different launchers. Oh, I couldn't believe how many launchers were were currently in development. It's crazy. <laughs> is that because there is a huge new market for these small satellites? That's uh, you know now that we're able to make these CubeSats, is everyone kind of clamoring to have these lower cost satellites? Uh, is that where all of this is coming from, or is this just a bit yeah. of a bubble? It's, it's coming at us. It's right on the horizon, coming across the horizon at us. Um, Time-wise, you're talking about a year or so away. Um, and, you know, like I said, there's hundreds of those CubeSats flying now. Um, you know, so people want to be able to launch those things today. Actually, for the launch vehicle market, the launch vehicles are actually, they're actually running behind. Uh, that market exists for them today. Um, NASA's paying to launch things. Every other government agency is paying to launch things. Any, any agency that does anything in space is paying to launch this stuff. So. Uh, Neuropilot asks, do you think the 12U, lar in quotes, large uh, CubeSats have more utility than several smaller CubeSats? It all depends on the science package, right? Um, the, the size of the optics that you need to fly or um, if you have to have a lot of power for things like Say you wanted to fly a radar mission on a, on a CubeSat, you could potentially do that. So its power um, and its heat and its optics are really driving the size. Um, yeah, so it really depends on the science that you need to do. Uh, Dutta actually asked from our control room, are the orbits of a CubeSat predictable, or is there any way to adjust the orbit and or attitude? Now, you mentioned some drives, but they're fairly low powered. So can you make course corrections with the current propulsion systems on board, or is that very limited? Uh, you can make course corrections. And the thing about the CubeSats is they only weigh, you know, one kilogram per CubeSat unit on, on average, right? So a 6U CubeSat is only going to weigh six kilograms uh, which is about 14 pounds rough and dirty. So, I mean, you're talking about a satellite that you can pick up and hold in your hands. I mean, not only is it that big, it doesn't weigh tons. It weighs, you know, you know, 15 pounds. Um, and so being able to move that around, um, you know, there are stock CubeSat-sized propulsion systems that people are selling today that you could bolt on to the avionics and the science package that you want and be able to get a pretty significant delta V. Uh, those things are commercially available um, for, for both large and small changes in velocity. All right, we're going to head to break in a moment, but there was a really interesting comment that just came in, uh, something that I hadn't considered before, and this comes from Kay McCoy, which is, um, is there any sense that maybe the CubeSat framework could become the standard for even larger satellites, that everything will start to be built in multiples of 10 centimeter sizes? So even these huge, huge satellites for, say, the National Reconnaissance Office will actually be built on a common CubeSat framework, and they end up being huge still, but there's this common framework between all satellites that go all the way down to 10 centimeters. Does it seem like a viable thing, or by the time you get to these large sat satellites, are they so specialized that that doesn't make any sense? Yeah, I think when you get above 
about 27U, which would be 30 by 30 by 30 centimeters. Beyond that, then you start to talk about it doesn't make sense to use those stock frameworks, although it may make sense to use the kind of avionics that we are building. Um, our avionics system is really quite capable and will use the exact same flight software that we've been working on for two decades. Uh, it's flown on, I don't even know how many, 17 missions, I think, is our, our stock, uh, you know, marketing pitch. It's 17th generation flight software. It already runs on this CubeSat uh, architecture. The other really, the really, really fancy thing we did, uh, our electrical engineers are some of the best anywhere, and we can now look at using power on these satellites that's greater than 500 watts uh, on, a, on a 3U CubeSat. Uh, generally, those things have been 10 watts to 50 watts. Now we're talking about 500 and above. So are you guys providing, uh, so you're providing more than just the software and prop. You, you have an entire framework for the CubeSat then as well. I mean, yep. it sounds like, right? So you have power generation. All I need to do, I, I buy your package from you, and all I need to do is put my instrument on board, it sounds like. Yep, we can provide that integration for you and all the way up to, you know, integrating it for you. And can you provide my instrumentation as well, including my optics? So if I want to just buy the whole thing from you, I say make it like this and you'll, you'll just sell me the whole thing? Or do I need to do that last step? Of course. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> where, where can, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, normally I have people just kind of go, wh where can I get more information on Northrop Grumman? Although that, that's fairly simple, but where can people go for more information on Northrop Grumman and what you're doing with CubeSats, as well as more information on you? Because I know that you do a lot of things in the uh, kind of the new space community. Um, I'm I'm pretty uh, readily available. Uh, Twitter.com slash VaxHeadroom, Facebook.com slash VaxHeadroom. My, uh, my, you can see behind me um, the various electronics and uh, things that are running behind me. I'm actually up in my recording studio uh, at home, and so my recording studio is UntiedMusic.com and Untied Music Studio on YouTube. As an interesting note, I think you're one of the few people who has music on the moon right now. If I I, right. Well... Yeah, I had, uh, we, we got to put a piece of music as a memory test pattern <laughs> on, uh, on the processor card on the L-Cross mission. So, uh, yeah, if the double EEPROMs survived, it's, uh, it's on the moon. <laughs> I don't think they survived. That, that, no, that was a, shattered pretty well. That was well. a fairly energetic event uh, on purpose. It was a fairly energetic event, but still very cool that you were yeah. able to do that. Uh, Vax, always a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, for those who don't know, Vax also came on and did a segment on Sea Dragon, which was an absolutely, you know, we need to do another one of those because it felt like you only had time to do some of the information. It, it would be great to do like a refresher because, and compare Sea Dragon to SpaceX's uh, BFR that they announced. I think that would be a lot of fun just to kind of do size comparisons yeah. and power comparisons. Uh, but that is a fascinating episode. I think that was last year, if I remember right. It might have been two yep. years ago. Uh, but yeah, uh, so search for uh, um, TMRO Sea Dragon, you'll find it. Uh, Vax, as always, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday and coming on the show. It was, it was fascinating and awesome. Absolutely. Love being here.